Thank you. Yes, indeed. All right, we're moving along in Jesus' name. For all of the pastors that are on Facebook or some kind of a projection on the radio, television, Facebook, you are dependent wholly, solely, at least wholly, upon technicians in your church. We couldn't do what we do without them. So kadoos to all of those that help project the word of Almighty God. Amen. I call your attention once again. Uh, there in 1 Samuel. And I'm going to just review a little uh, in that area, and namely chapter, to see where we are for this segment. We're not going through all of it, but we're going to tackle just a little bit of that by the help of the Lord. I'm looking for chapter 17, chapter 17, there in Exodus. Keep that in mind. I'm going to ask you to turn back there in a moment. But right now, amen. 1 Samuel chapter 15. Just recall that we began here. And the scripture makes mention in verse number 2 of chapter 15 of 1 Samuel. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek, did to Israel calls us to remember now one thing the Lord might not make a whole lot of noise but he doesn't forget he does not forget uh, he's talking about Amalek out of Exodus chapter 17 when the people of God came forth out of bondage, uh, Amalek, or the Amalekites, attacked the people of God. They blindsided them, surprised them, if you will, and fought against the people of God. And I can hear the Lord, and I can say it in my vernacular, uh-huh, you would dare to put your hands on my folk. Tell you what I'm going to do. I'm not going to tell you when, but I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. There in chapter 17 of Exodus, this is when, this is when um, Aaron and her held up the arms uh, of Moses. And while they held his arms up, Israel prevailed. And when they got tired as well and let his arms go down, then Amalek prevailed, okay? But it was the wrong thing for them to do, and that is to approach God's people. Verse number 14 of chapter 17 of the book of Exodus, And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. I don't know what all God had in store, but it came out of his mouth. And what he says, he will do. He will bring it to pass. Somebody said the wheels of God's justice may grind slowly, but they grind finally. And we're grateful unto the Lord because of this great truth. And the scripture says, And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. For he said, Because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek, from generation to generation. 
So Amalek, after about 400 years, no doubt perished. But he had descendants, which are referred to as Amalekites. Amalekites. And they emerge in 1 Samuel and chapter 15. And I want you to know God has a good memory. Aren't you glad that he does? Because he has not forgotten you. He will always remember those that are on his side. And those that war against him, <laughs> his memory is just as sharp, if you will. Okay? Now, 1 Samuel chapter 15, as we continue, uh, about David. I just want to make a couple notes and then move to the area about David of our study. Uh, verse number 2 again of chapter 15 of 1 Samuel. Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way. When he came up from Egypt, now go and do what? Smite Amalek and utterly, that's completely, overwhelmingly, destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman. In did God say that? Yes, he did. Infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. It's collection time. It's time for the Lord to have his way. And we're grateful unto the Lord because of his sovereign will. And we, understood, we understand what took place. Amen. And as you're coming in, you can move up if you want to just a little bit so I can see you. Amen. I want to see the tongue and cheek. I want to see the eye movement. And <laughs> that's good. That's good. You know, you know, one thing preachers are adjusting. Um, individuals want to counsel with the pastor and confess over the telephone. Y'all don't hear me. <laughs> and the thing about who says they're not doing a, a tongue-in-cheek, you know, with the phone up, laughing at what they say I'm getting over on the pastor. So, so we, I want to see us. <laughs> I want to see us so we can communicate properly. But... Um, as we touch on this area, it's not the main area for this evening, but it gives us a little understanding about where we were. Look at verse number 8 of chapter 15 of 1 Samuel. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites. Amalek has grown in a period of 400 years. Take them alive and utterly destroy all the people with the edge of the sword. And Saul and the people spared who? Agag, the king, and the best of the sheep. You know, I'm the pastor of the church, but I can't be footloose and fancy free. I can't. Saints of God, I can't do anything that I want to do because I'm the pastor. 
Amen. If God's word becomes uh, explicit, then I must take heed to what he is saying. I don't know what he's doing. I don't know who he's paying off or what he told somebody long time ago. Amen. And if he wants to use me in his judgment or otherwise, he can do it. So we ought to, all of us, obey God rather than man. Do what he says. Even if it doesn't make any sense, still yet do what God is calling for. I ought to get an amen out of that. I got one or two. <laughs> but it's true anyhow. Amen. Well, long story short, you know the text. Uh, in the 15th chapter, you know what is being done. And that is the king that the people chose. Amen. When they already had a king, they did. Who was the king? God was the king. They didn't want him. They wanted to be like everybody else. Okay. You want a king? You got a king. Okay. So this king didn't have certain things that God is looking for. Hallelujah. In my business, I put uh, pastors in a church. Or at times, there is a separating time. Amen. I can't see everything. I'm solely dependent upon the Lord. But those potential men and women have to have the mind of God. They, they have to have an obedient spirit to the will of God. You don't know who's going to try to talk you out of doing what you ought to do. Amen. You got to make up in your mind, for God I'll live and for God I'll die. I'll do what the Lord says, do. If he says kill everything, the animals... Kill all the people. Amen. Even sucklings, infants, and even the king. Kill them all. That's what God wanted. Now, in our grown-up minds, sometimes we do it our way. Don't raise your hand. But have we ever thought there's a better way than what God is saying to us? Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. Just a thought. Uh, and sometimes we want to help God. Uh, take that hand down and leave it alone. Amen. So Samuel, uh, God's representative, uh, was representing God, of course, and he's the one that anointed Saul. Amen. At God's command, anoint him. This is the one that the people want. It's not the one that I want, but it's the one that the people want. And the scripture says in verse number 13 that he came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Did he? No, he didn't. No, he didn't. And Samuel said, what meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ear and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, I can imagine he was stuttering about this time, they have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God and the rest we have utterly destroyed. That wasn't the orders that came from Samuel. The Lord said utterly, completely, don't save anything or anybody. The, in other words, the Lord has a score to settle with the descendants of Amalek, the Amalekites at this time. It's been almost 400 years, but God has not forgotten. And I cause us to recall again 
Amen. When you were a child and your mama told you to do something, you don't have to think too hard. And you did what you wanted to do. And she looked at you. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. There's one, there's one thing that Dave, one word that describes David uh, or an expression. It says, David behaved himself. David behaved. I can remember my mother saying as I'm going out the door, behave. <laughs> That's old church talk. You better behave. And when you didn't do what you were supposed to do, there were repercussions. I won't stay on that, but it's good to know. And verse number 22 of chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, and Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? You made a mistake. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Don't push the sacrifice up under my nose. There's something better than your sacrifice, and that is your obedience. And to hearken then the fat of rams. And, of course, he was in trouble, and the Lord was ready to dethrone him, take him down. Amen. He said in verse 23, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. He didn't say that rebellion is witchcraft, but it's just like it. Amen. And stubbornness is like iniquity. Stubbornness. And idolatry. Stubbornness and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath in the same breath also rejected thee from being king. Wow. What a price to pay. And that's not all. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned. But of course, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words because I feared the people. That's the wrong person to be over the people. And obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. It's not that easy. Amen. My strong mother would say, you're going to get a whipping, wouldn't she? You're going to get a weapon. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. It was at that time that Samuel got the word from the Lord. Back off of him. Leave him alone. I got a bead on him. Amen. It's time for me to bring judgment against him. Verse number 28, and Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day and hath given it to a neighbor. He didn't say who. Of thine that is better than thou. Amen. Uh, later on we see the Lord dealing with Agag. See, he spared Agag, the king, and the Lord uh, had him destroyed. And Samuel showed him, this is what God wanted you to do with Agag, the king. I'm going to show you. I'm going to demonstrate. And Samuel said in verse number 33, as thy word hath made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. 
hewed a gap. I can imagine with the sword that he had, <laughs> not only did he cut him, he chopped him and stabbed him and hacked him, maybe till limbs came off. This is a demonstration of how you should have done. This is a time of God's judgment, and you and I have nothing to say about it but to do God's bidding. Wow. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to the house of Gibeah, of Saul. And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. Amen. This is where we began, okay? And I didn't know how far we would go, but it's tempting. It looks good. Chapter 16, we dealt with in regards to Samuel bidding, doing the bidding of God, okay? And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul? Amen. It's still on Samuel's mind. He's still broken up on the inside. Amen. And that is something I can understand in you too. Amen. Remember when uh, Aaron's sons offered strange fire before the Lord? Amen. They were supposed to get the fire off of the altar, amen, in the courtyard because God from heaven sent fire down to light the coals on the altar. And when it was burning, then the priest was supposed to get fire from the same place that came from heaven and light their censers and the smoke would rise. My, my. But his sons, what were those sons' names? Anybody remember? Who? Hophni and Phinehas. Amen. Right then, what did the Lord do? Anybody? Pardon me? He slayed him. How did he slay him? You won't, you won't use the fire from heaven to light your censers? I'll send another flame. The Lord sent fire from heaven and devoured them. Amen. That's what God can do. My, my. We've got to read that. Maybe not now, but we've got to. To read that. And one thing about it, I'm, look, I'm thinking of Samuel still kind of upset. One thing about it, when, when, when the Lord lit up Aaron's son, all Aaron could do, if they were to the side, all Aaron could do is my sons. He had to keep his composure. He could not fight God or lend his countenance in their defense. He had to keep his composure. He knew his boys were gone, but he had to refrain from running over to them. My, 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 my. <laughs> But the Lord must be obeyed. Thank you, Jesus. Chapter 16, the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from uh, reigning over Israel? Feel now. Now keep in mind, Saul is still on the throne. The Lord rejected him. And he will remove him in his time. 
But right now, the Lord is about ready to let someone else be king. I heard one preacher said, if you don't, somebody else will. Make up in our minds. Lord, help us to have that kind of resolve that I must work the works of him that sent me. I must do what God says do. That doesn't mean you're not human. You are. But remember Aaron and his sons. He kept his composure as his sons died in his presence. If God does it, it's right. It's right. My, my, my. Fill thine horn with oil and gold. He is sending, God is sending Samuel to the house of Jesse. Okay? Because he has more work. So, Samuel, you got to straighten up, buddy. Get yourself together. Take a deep breath. Get a glass of water. If you have to smack yourself on the cheeks, get yourself together. I've got work for you. I'm sending you to the house of Jesse. Amen. My king is in his house. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have proved me a king. Amen. Um, among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hear it, if Saul finds out that he's going to Jesse's house to anoint a king, he'll kill me. Because he's, he thinks in his mind he's still the king. And the Lord said, take an heifer with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. That used to bother me whenever I would read this area. That would bother me, and I can hardly say it. Did the Lord just make up a story? You hear how I'm saying it, because God does not lie. He told his prophet, tell him you come to offer sacrifice. Is that what he went to Jesse's house for, to offer sacrifice? Somebody said that was part of it. <laughs> he really went there to anoint a king, and he didn't know which one of Jesse's sons. But he knew if Saul finds out that I'm going to raise up another king, he'll kill me. Tell him you come to offer sacrifice. It bothered me until, you know, sometimes you keep reading in the word of the Lord and you see things. Amen. You see things. I'm looking for, somebody get chapter 11 and verse number 15. And whoever gets it, I want you to come up to the microphone so those that are listening will, will hear it. Somebody's going to jump up right now. And read that verse. Hallelujah. 1 Samuel chapter 11 and verse number 15. They're going to grab that microphone like a preacher would grab it. Amen. Here comes somebody. <laughs> this is good. This is good. It bothered me what the Lord told Samuel, to say, tell him you're going to offer sacrifice. Now, here, we're going to see something. Go right ahead, sir. This is the first king that God allowed them to have. 
and they had sacrifice at the time of anointing. That set the precedent. That's the way God wants it when a king, a new king comes in and is anointed. There's to be a sacrifice. So the Lord wasn't trying to hoodwink us, and he didn't lie. Like they did it before, we're going to do it again with this king. Woo! I hear you, Lord. I hear you. I hear you. And the scripture is good. Amen. Now, we could go on and on rehearsing this area. Well, one of the greatest, uh, one of the greatest sayings out of the Old Testament uh, and this is a great saying, man looketh on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. And that's difficult for us. We can't see a person's heart. That means some things we have to leave to God that he might take care of it. Okay? Uh, verse number 7, but the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on it his countenance or on his height or the height of his stature because I have refused him. Uh, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Wow. The perception and the knowledge that God has I've said before, Lord, I don't know why you chose me to do what I'm doing, but he must have seen something. My, my. So I don't want to let the Lord down. How about you? He brought you into his kingdom for such a time as this. Lord, I want to be right. I want to be holy. I want to be real. Don't you? Hallelujah, I want to do his bidding. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. You know, he paraded his sons. And I can see Samuel uh, being moved by the Spirit of God. Nope, he's not the one. Nope, not that one. Nope, nope, none of these. None of these. He just felt that way. Hallelujah. You got any more, son? I have one out tendon sheet. I'm trying to condense this. And he's a young lad. He's ruddy. And as he tends the sheep, he doesn't smell too good. He's got the sheep's oil on him. Dirty, he's out in the night. We're not going to eat. We're not going to eat till we get him. Amen. Well, verse number 12, and he sent and brought him in. And he was ruddy and with all of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him. For this is he. I want to please God. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren right in front. Now David was the youngest, can you imagine? Maybe a little spirit of envy. Who does he think he is? Amen. Sometimes the Lord doesn't go in the line of birth. Sometimes he goes back and gets the last one. That happens in Scripture. It depends on what God is looking for. Give me a Scripture, somebody. The first shall be last. You know, the Lord talks that way because he sees how 
there will be a situation ahead of him, amen, that they need to prepare for. The first shall be last. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, long story short, verse number 14, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. That's a difficult time, y'all. The Spirit of the Lord, that's the ingredient. People don't understand. You've got to have the Spirit of God. And at this point, and again, the wheels of God may grind slowly, but they grind finally. He lost his anointing. Ooh. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Now don't get, don't misunderstand. An evil spirit from the, from the Lord. That, that doesn't mean evil spirits are on God. Doesn't mean that at all. Amen. He has control. He has all power. All the Lord has to do, his hands are on you and me like this. All he has to do is remove it. Any and every foul spirit has an opportunity to come in our direction. Do you think your ability with the word of God keeps you? Your longevity with God, you think that keeps you in the church? You're kept because he keeps you. It's not your wit, your knowledge, your understanding. It's the power of God. All he has to do is back off. And the enemy comes in. My, my, my. So thank God he's in control. And Saul's servants said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Thank you, Jesus. So there was a switch, a formal switch, if you will. The anointing came on who? David, that little ruddy boy. Didn't smell too good. Now, mind you, he said, man, looketh on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. God saw way down the road how David would be used by him. David was his man. Knowing him, for this is he. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Um, I, might, I might ask at this point, are we doing all right? There may be some area that you want to ask a question or make a comment. If so, this would be a good time before we move any further. Thank you, Jesus. All right. All right. Um, I would encourage us to keep reading. Now, if you get to it again, the same area, and uh, you said, oh, I read that not too long. Read it again. Read it again. Be surprised with the Lord. He doesn't give everything at once, all at one setting. It's here a little. And there a little, line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon precept. That's how the Lord uh, deals with us. Amen. And it takes a lifetime to begin to understand what the will of God is. I'm going to ask you, uh, if you will, we're going to, I want to get into, if we can, uh, David dealing uh, with his nemesis, and that's Goliath. Okay, Goliath. And uh, there are some preliminaries, but I want to get right in to this. Uh, chapter number 17. Let's pick up the reading in verse number 36. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. That's David's 
credentials. Now, my eye goes up when I hear he's, he killed a lion and a bear. That grabs my attention right away. Amen. But that's not where he gets his power. He gets his power from God, his ability from the Lord. Amen. He slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defiled the armies of the living God. Not just the way he is acting toward God, but even the armies of God. He's defied the armies. You're trying to make God look bad. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivereth me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. Amen. You, you, you think Shaq is big. My, my, my. Now, look, Shaq is big, y'all. I saw... It was Shaq and uh, uh, Charles Barkley sitting on a seat, one here, one there, and someone was sitting between them. And the one sitting between them was a wrestler called The Rock. When he sat between those two giants, he looked like a little twerp. He was, <laughs> he was so small. My goodness, those men were giants. But they weren't. Shaq was not as big and tall as this giant that David fought. Woo. He was about nine feet tall. Amen. Huge. And he talked that way. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. This is the confidence that Saul had in him knowing what God had done for him and through him. And Saul armed David with his armor. Well, he's trying, but it's going to take more than his armor. And he put a helmet uh, of brass upon his head. Also, he armed him with a coat of mail. Okay? All of this armor. Well, David girded his sword uh, upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proven it. All of this armor, can you imagine this little boy and those grown-up clothes? I've got a couple of pictures. Some of you may have similar. I, uh, I've got a couple of pictures of my children when they were smaller. One put on my hat. And the other put on my sport coat. And you couldn't even see their hands. The coat was so big. And the hat, well, you could take it and just turn it around. It was so big. Can you imagine David putting on the armor of grown folks? Amen. David put them off. Well, the scripture says, and David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. I don't know how to use this. I've never gone into fighting a lion or a bear or an enemy with this garb on. I don't know how to use it. Amen. David put them off him, put them off him, and he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag, little shepherd's bag, five small, smooth stones. Somebody said they represent what? Yeah. 
Well, before that, you're getting ahead of me just a little bit. <laughs> what do they, what, what, Jay? Jesus. Amen. Wow. Um, what did you say, Mr. Moyer? Goliath and his four brothers. We probably won't get to that, but in 2 Samuel 21, 15 through 17, I believe, uh, there are others in Goliath's family. Someone said, in case they come, he already has enough stones to slay them as well. And that could be true. We, we've got some food for thought. But I like J-E-S-U-S. -S. I like that better. His name is Jesus, author and finisher of our faith. Hallelujah. Somebody said in a song, take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then wherever you go. Precious name. Oh, how sweet. It's the hope and joy of heaven. Name, Jesus. Demons tremble at the name of Jesus. So it's important to arm yourself, amen, with the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Verse 45, then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Thinking with his strength, his physical strength, he could subdue the armies of God. Amen. But he's got another thought coming. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. He's talking pretty big. Amen. But it's true. And I will give thy carcass to the hosts of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of, uh, of the air. Didn't read that right. And to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is whose? It's the Lord's battle. Tell yourself that the next time you find yourself into a battle up to your nose. Tell yourself, this battle belongs to the Lord. And in your heart and mind, step back and watch the Lord move in your life. Hallelujah. And he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hastened. And what did he do? He ran toward the enemy. My, my, how many of us, Lord help, <laughs> would run toward the enemy? If we have the kind of confidence in God that we ought to have, we too can run in the face of our enemies. Hallelujah. David hastened and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. My, my, my. I can see that young lad. Ah, calls the young because they're strong. That doesn't mean an old man can't run. Hallelujah. David put his hand into his bag. You mean after all of what the king gave him? And yes, that big hat and all of that brass and metal, he didn't need that. He got in his bag, hallelujah, and took thence a stone and slang it, smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone did what? Sunk into his forehead and fell upon his face to the earth. I can just visualize, I can see it 
Now he's just mouthing and slobbering and saying one thing or another, and the next moment he's falling like he was a wet rag. David didn't stop there. Amen. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in his hand, in the hand of David. Thank you, Jesus. Therefore, David ran and stood upon the Philistine. What did he do? Took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and did what? Amen. Cut his head, head therewith. Cut his head off. That giant was the enemy of God's people. And he cut his head off. Thank you, Jesus. I like this. Have you ever had something that nagged you? I mean, really? You, you would be embarrassed if somebody knew because you're a child of God and you fought with it and fought with it and every now and then it sticks its head up again and you're wondering, do they know I've, I've got this kind of fight? Did I have to contend with this? And it just stayed with you and stayed with you. You got to cut its head off. That's what you got to do. That pesky test or trial, amen, that can cool your heels and make you quiet, make you hold your head down. And look around. It needs its head removed so it won't bother you no more. Look, when he cut the giant's head off, the giant didn't move. And we all have a giant every now and then come around in our life. David's telling us, I got a secret how you can get rid of him. Cut his head off. He may not say it this way, but cut his head off in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Now I'm going to ask you. Amen. David brought the head back. Okay. How many stones did he bring back? What would you say? All five? Why did he bring five? One sunk in his head. <laughs> my, my. If he was in a sanctified church, he'd start dancing. <laughs> Amen. And then you'd have to hit the piano. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Everybody say victory. Man, you said it like you was tired. Lift your hands and shout, victory. victory. All right, all right. There's nothing like it. There's nothing that tastes as good as victory. You may not be able to tell everybody about it because you fought so long, and maybe you missed sometimes. Amen. But when you get the victory, there's a smile on your face and in your heart and in your mind. Hallelujah. And you can say, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. There's nothing like victory in Christ Jesus. No wonder the songwriter wrote that song, Victory in Jesus. My Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. I love the hymns. Thank you, Jesus. And I praise God for the victory. He has given us literally anything and everything that we need to make it from here to glory. Amen. And David is telling us a good story. Thank you, Jesus. He got victory. Now, that's the one the Lord chose. And he's letting us know this is why I chose him. 
I want somebody that will run to the enemy. Woo! If you run to the enemy, people think you're out of your mind. But run for the enemy. Thank you, Jesus. You have what you need. You have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and you know how to pray. And you know how to pray till something happens. Thank you, Jesus. Power of God's Spirit working on the inside. Amen. Well, I'm through. I'm through for tonight. Lest there would be a, an observation or a question about Brother Jason, this little ruddy boy.